All right. Hello, Don. Hi, Whoop. I'm sitting here with Don Henley. I'm going to tell a little story about you because it, it shows my great affection for you and why uh, I think you're so remarkable. I should tell people they probably know you best from the Eagles. They know that you do great solo stuff and they know about Walden Woods. But I got to hang out with you on the stage at Carnegie Hall. <laughs> at Carnegie Hall, uh, where I found myself in the company of Don Henley, James Taylor, uh, Natalie Cole, Elton John, uh, Sting, mm -hmm. and you. It was very nerve-wracking for me because I had a duet to do with Sting, and you guys were all there, and you were all singers. Come on, you all sang. And all day, I'd had a tough old day. And when I went on, right before I went on, you saddled up behind me looking absolutely delicious in this tuxedo. And you said, maybe this will help you. And you handed me a fan. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, with all that you had to do on that day, how did you... I mean, yes, I was verbal about being for very nervous. But what made you do that? What made you give me that fan? I was scared too, you know. I was really nervous because at Carnegie Hall, you know, is a big, it's a big deal. I've heard of Carnegie Hall all my life, but I've never been in there, much less performed in there. Right. So I was, I was very empathetic with you when you were talking about being nervous, you know. And and I sort of checked around to see what kind of a number you're doing. It was kind of a, a Latin number, one of right. those, you know, fruit on your head, <laughs> kind of numbers. So. I, I just figured it might be good to have something for you to to hold, to hold on to, you know, because when you're singing, you can hold on to the microphone, you, right. grip, you know, for dear life. You can grip the microphone stand until you bend it. And I just thought it might be good for you to have something in your hand, you know, so. I have to admit, though, I didn't go out and get that myself. I sensed a friend of mine went out and got it, but I, I asked him, I asked her to do it. So. Uh, well, you have endeared yourself to me forever, <laughs> forever. Well, you sent me that note in the yeah, and flowers and yeah. said, I'm your biggest fan. Well, <laughs> I was trying, yes, I was trying to be cute, you know. I was trying to pick you up, too, but I'll tell you more about that when we come back. Let me ask you, because we've heard a lot about Walden Woods. What exactly is Walden Woods? Why, why save it? What, there's so much out there. There's the dolphins, there's the ocean. What is Walden Woods? I know there's a lot of things. It becomes a little overwhelming sometimes to try to figure out which thing you're going to do. Yeah. I mean, that's what's amazing about you is you do all of them. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I have no job. <laughs> I don't know where you find the time to sleep. But uh, Walden Woods is sort of the beginning of all these battles that we, we hear about now. You know, uh, Walden Woods is the first place uh, where our culture asserted... The, the, sim the spirit of conservation, in other words, that, that mankind or humankind should live in harmony with nature and not try to conquer it. You know, it's the birthplace of the environmental movement, really. Henry David Thoreau, back in the mid-1800s, uh, put forth these concepts have, that have become the cornerstone of the conservation movement and the environmental movement. So I believe in first places, you know, I right. believe in beginnings, and I believe in trying to preserve uh, places where things started. You know, we, we get all hot and bothered about civil war monuments and war monuments right. and stuff and we can preserve all that kind of stuff you know where uh, sort of monuments to to violence and right. people who died violently and things like that but it seems to me like we ought to be able to preserve the place where where humans humankind first tried to establish the principle of harmony with, with nature is that is that something you look for in your life harmony some kind of balance somehow yeah i look <laughs> for it <laughs> is it hard to find well yeah it is you know it's it's hard to walk that middle line between deficiency and excess, you know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I guess coming out of the rock and roll world, that would be, that's yeah. true. Yeah, and living that's in true. America. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, we're, we're a nation of excesses, you know. But uh, Thoreau, Thoreau's principle was to live simply, you know. He mm. said simplify, simplify, try to simplify your life as much as possible. And Walden is symbolic of all the other battles that are going on around the country, right. you know. Now, to me... Uh, I know that, that Henry David Thoreau has, has a lot of meaning for you, and Emerson, mm -hmm. uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Uh, the spirituality that these gentlemen have has really sort of taken over 
a lot of your thinking in the last several years. Was that a surprise for you, that suddenly you were moving in a completely different direction? No, actually, I'm, what has happened is I've come full circle. They had a big influence on me when I was about 20 or 21. Mm. And then I moved to California. <laughs> you, where did you come from? Texas. Texas. A small town of about 2,400 people near the Arkansas and Louisiana border over in northeast Texas. Honey, too. what were you what What were you doing? What were you doing in Texas? I was sitting at the Dairy Queen watching the trucks go by. Uh, I was playing music. I I was in a band ever since I was 15. And uh, you know, um, went to high school there, and then I went to college for four years right. in Texas. And uh, came out here in 1970. Right with my band, with my buddies that I'd grown up with. Right. Not, did, not the Eagles. This is pre-Eagles. Pre -Eagles. Did you grow up with the love of nature? People don't think of Texas as sort of this lush, outside, but... No. People think of Texas as a desert, you know. They think right. of cactus and armadillos right. and cowboys and, and boiling sunshine. But uh, the part of Texas I'm from is really part of the South. It looks more like this Georgia and Alabama mm. and Mississippi. It's got a lot of beautiful lakes and streams and trees. Right. And I spent my childhood outdoors. You know, really? All of it doing all that Huckleberry Finn stuff, you know, just in, uh, catching frogs and torturing his mom. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and my dad farmed part-time, not for a living, but for the enjoyment of it, and he made me work in the garden, you know. And, really? Uh, so I, I realized the older I got uh, that that was important, especially after I moved out here and lived in the big city. It this was quite a shock. shock. It yeah, was a I big bet. shock for me to come out. So, like, you come from this little town. What is, what is the visual? that you see when you get here? First thing I remember seeing, we came in at night. It was on one of those clear, sparkly nights mm. that we get maybe 10 times a year. And the first thing, thing I remember seeing was the Capitol Records Tower. And I went, hallelujah, I've reached the promised land. <laughs> and uh, I'll never forget that. But uh, I'd never seen anything quite this big. You know, I'd lived right. in Dallas for a while, but that right. didn't prepare me for the culture shock that I right. had when I got out here. What clubs were around when you got here? Uh, well, the whiskey, of course, right. and Gazzari's, of course. Right, but right. the club, the, the club that really was seminal, that was the focal point at that time, was the Troubadour. That's where we hung out. That's okay. where uh, a lot of people got started. Just most of the people that we listened to, you know, of our generation, got right. started at the Troubadour. So now you come in the door of the Troubadour. Who would you just sort of see hanging out? Well, you'd see Linda Ronstadt, you'd see Joni Mitchell, you'd see Neil Young, Graham Nash, uh, Chris Christopherson, uh, you know, just uh, Janis Joplin. Right. Was your mouth on the floor? Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. I went, wow. <laughs> but after a while, you know, I sort of became friends with some of these people and went to work for Linda Ronstadt, actually. Right. Um, I met my buddies Glenn Fry and J.D. Souther in the right. Troubadour Bar. And... Uh, Glenn bought me a beer one night and asked me if I would like to go on the road with Linda Ronstadt for two, 200 bucks a week because my group from Texas was breaking up at the right, time. We were right. sort of breaking apart. And 200 bucks a week sounded like a lot of money at that time. This was in 1970 or 71, maybe, 70. And I said, sure, you know. So I went, and uh, Glenn and I struck up a friendship and started sort of planning. Uh, Glenn had already plotted to have a group. Right. And uh, I was sort of the second in command, I guess. Right. You know, you guys wrote so many amazing songs. For me, it's like, when I listen to them, it's a bit like reading poetry. Simply because I, well, you know, you think of Byron. I think of you as very Byron-esque. Mm. You know, Thank and every, you. every generation has their poets, you know. And there were a lot of poets in the time that we're talking about. But you guys managed to put together some really wonderful stuff like Tequila Sunrise and Desperado and One of These Nights and Lion Eyes and Hotel California. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you ever think of it as poetry? No. It, poetry is hard. You think so? <laughs> yeah. Why? Uh, great poetry is, is a couple of steps above songwriting, I think. Uh, I think it's harder and it's, it's more intellectual and more difficult. and, and uh, I guess uh, some, maybe some songwriting approaches poetry. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe Bob Dylan and a few other people a couple of times. Uh, Paul Simon, maybe, and Randy Newman. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, we wrote a few good tunes. We hit the nail on the head sometimes, and we, we missed it by miles. Don. Right. A few good tunes. Come on now, honey, please. Please, let me get oh, my okay. wading boots on. Right. You wrote some pretty amazing stuff. You, you don't take a lot of credit on yourself. 
I think. Well, <laughs> I might at, at home. <laughs> <laughs> when you're in the tub. When I'm in the tub. But, uh, no, we wrote, we wrote some songs that I'm proud of. Right. You know? right. It's just... Uh, we sort of learned as we went along. You yeah. know, you can sort of see a progression from the beginning to the, to the end, and, and I think we got better yeah. you know, as a whole, and that's, yeah. that's what makes me happy about it. Right. But I just hope to keep uh, writing songs. I hope to get better at what I do. You know, right. I'm never quite satisfied with it, and I think that's the only way you do get better is not to rest on your laurels. So uh, I'm looking forward to the rest of it. You know? Well, I'm going to adjust my laurels, and we'll be right back. <laughs> But I think of you as one of those men who is very chivalrous, who would stand and read you poetry as he poured you a glass of wine. Are you a romantic? Well, I studied... The, in college, I was an English major, and I studied the romantic poets and... Uh, no, I, no. I mean, are you a romantic? <laughs> I'm trying to get around. I know you're trying to get around that. Yeah, sure. Sure. Not much romance left in the world, you know. No. Not much in this town. It's, it's tough. It's tough. You know, there are no fountains to splash in. You're at, <laughs> well, honey, maybe you're in the wrong neighborhood. Well, maybe you might get arrested if you did, you know. you can't. Some friends of mine just came back from Paris, you know, and they were yes. raving about how romantic it was over there. And it's, I don't know, maybe it's. Maybe I'm just getting older, but it seems like it used to be a little ro more romantic around here, you know. Mm. But sure, I mean, you know, Yeats is my favorite poet. Really? Yeah. Yeats. <laughs> <laughs> so now, are you ever, do you ever wonder if you're going to settle down? like have the picket fence and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Sometimes I wonder, but I, I feel like it's coming. You yeah. Know? yeah. I just want to be ready, you know. I don't want to make the mistake that a lot of people make, which is doing it before you grow up. Uh, and it takes men a long time to grow up sometimes. Do I you mean, think so? Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, I've not hit it either. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> I jump in and then jump back it takes out. women sometimes. You know, well, you got to get it right. You know, it, it, few people get it right the first time. You know, mm. look at the statistics. Yeah. You know, but I'm I'm uh, working toward that, you know. Well, Don, have you ever considered that perhaps, you know, I don't know, a woman who's five, six, <laughs> uh, a little hefty on the back end, but not much, maybe dark with long braids, perhaps you you look in, in the, you know, maybe it's time to look over on the sort of on heftier the, on the side, side, on the darker <laughs> side. I just thought I'd throw that in for me. Okay. You know, because a girl can't, you know, you can't ever try too often. That's mm -hmm. what I say. All right, all right. Do you believe that? I believe that. Okay. <laughs> Music always seems to have, there's a, a, a general theme, I think, in songs. I found her. <laughs> I loved her. She left me. Right. Why do people, why is it always, about, why are there so few songs about love gone right? I don't know, you know, there's a great woman writer named Willa Cather who said mm. there are only five or six human stories and they keep on repeating themselves just as desperately as if they had never happened. You know, and I, I guess that's good. Yeah. I guess it's good that we can get up in the morning and do it again, you know. Yeah. But I don't know, it's hard to write those happy songs. Most, most great art down through the ages has been wrought out of pain and suffering, you right. know. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's hard to, to write one of those bouncy, happy tunes. It makes me <laughs> sick. <laughs> <laughs> Um, when you split, do you get... I was part of a duo. Really? Yeah. Actually, I've been a part of two duos. And one of the things that happened with us is people began to... Because visually, I'm something, or I was something at the time that you would remember, because there wasn't <laughs> anything that looked like me. But we went through kind of like a depression when we split up, because suddenly it was as though... We didn't know who we were. Mm -hmm. Do you, when you have more people around you, i.e. a group, does the same thing happen? Yeah, well, there's safety in numbers, you know, in a group. Uh, if one guy's down, the other guy can carry the ball. You know, it's kind of like a sports team. And uh, Yeah, I mean, if, if you're asking me if it was rough on me when the group broke up, the answer is yes, because I wasn't quite mentally prepared for it. Mm. Uh, I knew that it wasn't going to go on forever, right. you know, but I wasn't quite prepared for the ab abruptness with which it disintegrated. Right. You know? So I, uh, I went through a rough period there for a while, but, you know, I'm, I'm a survivor. I usually don't stay down for too long. I usually pick myself up off the floor yeah. and get on with it, you know. Yeah. Lust for life? Yeah, carpe diem, you know. Just get on with it. We'll be right back. Now, Don, 
This is the book I'm in with you. That's right, honey. You in there. It's called Heaven is Under Our Feet. I have the str I've written you the strangest piece for this you, book. Uh, you you it are a out singular there. figure yes. in the book. <laughs> Definitely <laughs> singular. So this is uh, available and out there. Uh, and there's a lot of other things. You are in, in a funny kind of way spreading your seeds. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Do you want to explain? Let me to clarify Yes, that. please do. Okay. Uh, first of all, the book is, is a wonderful book. It's 67 essays by various authors, including your, your fine self. Thank you, baby. You spoke more on the civil disobedience aspect of Mr. Thoreau. Yes. Uh, and uh, we've sold 70,000 of these in hardcover. It's about to come out in softcover very soon now. Wow. I'll be promoting it. Yeah a bookstore near you. Correct. And congrats. And uh, we also have a tree program. We're in conjunction with an organization called Global Relief, spelled R-E-L-E-A-F. Uh, it's part of the famous and historic trees program. And what these folks do is they go into Walden Woods and they gather up the seeds from the river birches and from the red maple trees. And then they take them to a greenhouse in Florida and they sprout them. And when they're about 18 to 36 inches high, they wrap them in these tubes and they ship them all over the world to people wow. who want to buy them. So you can order a tree and plant a little bit of Walden Woods right in your backyard or at your school or in your community park or whatever you want to do. And we, uh, the trees are $35. They're guaranteed to grow if wow. you plant them properly. <laughs> and uh, you get a certificate of auth uh, authenticity signed by yours truly. Ooh. And you get the Walden Woods Project newsletter. You also get the Global Relief newsletter. And um, you get a great tree. These trees are beautiful in the autumn. The leaves turn really bright red and orange. Now, you mean to tell me if people write to Famous and Historic Trees at 8555 Plummer Road, Jacksonville, Florida, at 32219, that's the zip code, you mean to tell me they can get a little piece of Walden Woods? Right, and they'll be helping us save Walden Woods. Well, Don, I'm definitely going to order my <laughs> trees, honey. And I'm thrilled Thank that you. you came. Thanks, I had a great time. Good. See you tomorrow. So did this fly. And this fly is just <laughs> happening all over the place. It's frightening.